Thank you, thank you, thank you. So our next speaker, we, we're going even further afield now from emerging markets, we're going to New Zealand. Uh, we're very also honored to have uh, Jane Retimana with us. Jane is uh, the general manager at uh, Payments NZ. Payments NZ is the sort of banking uh, association in New Zealand. They are, as we said during this morning, they're driving or they're having an open banking uh, initiative driven by the private sector. So really curious to hear a little bit more about that. Jane, your, the floor is yours. How, how was your trip to London? Yeah, it was very good. Actually, I just have to, um, it's four o'clock in the morning back <laughs> in New Zealand. So if anyone can use open banking data to cure jet lag, that you'd make a lot of money. <laughs> Definitely. For the next hackathon. Yeah, absolutely. Anyone follow the rugby? Yeah, commiserations, both of us, those damn South Africans. Okay, well, that, well, that gets up. Um, thanks for having me here. I'm Jane Retimana. I'm from, as Ismail said, I'm from Payments New Zealand. And Payments New Zealand, we are a payments association, actually, not the Bankers Association. But we were set up in New Zealand after the GFC about 10 years ago um, to basically expand openness in payment systems. We have a payment system mandate. Um, for New Zealand to have the most modern and progressive payment system in the world. Um, I don't know how well we're going on that, but we're on a journey. Um, payments New Zealand has three kind of three things that we're doing now. We uh, govern and work with the industry on um, interbank settlement for clearing systems, payment systems. So um, probably small change for all of you, but in New Zealand we... Um, manage, we govern and manage the um, two interbank clearing systems. They're put through about seven trillion New Zealand dollars through um, these systems a year. Uh, we also work with the industry and the wider um, payments ecosystem um, on setting industry strategy. And um, I head up a, a program called Payments Direction, and that's our long-term industry strategy to look at um, modernised infrastructure, payments infrastructure, and also at um, enabling capabilities, those non-competitive, um, very payments interoperability kind of enabled um, building those capabilities uh, with, the, with the industry. And um, now, uh, for our SINs or others, other things, um, we also get to manage um, uh, API standards framework, which is why I'm here to talk to you today, and I'll just keep rolling on through my presentation without the slides. Um, so just to give you a bit of context about, um, about New Zealand, so we're highly banked, I think 99.5% banked, although I take the point of the previous um, speaker about you can have a bank account, but whether you're using it is a different thing. Um, so we're highly banked, we're highly um, electronic payments usage is very high in New Zealand. We've had a proprietary debit card um, in New Zealand since the 80s, um, very prolific and um, very, very well used by, the, by um, Kiwi citizens. So um, Kiwis are used to paying by card, they're used to internet banking, um, they're used to, um, I think we know one as a nation that's um, yeah, very high, very kind of tech savvy. Um, we're also an export economy, um, so we're always trying to sell things overseas, um, particularly into, into Australia and China. And we've got very light touch financial regulation, and that happened um, in the late 80s. And so that just gives you a little bit of context to the New Zealand market. We're a little bit different. Um, the scale of our market's really small, so our um, banks and, and um, competitors and financial services have had to collaborate on a lot over the years. Um, it's very rare that a bank can bring a, um, a, a kind of a product to market and, and, and kind of capture the whole value chain. So collaboration is definitely um, something that, that we do. Uh, as part of our long term, just to give you context to why we actually got into 
open banking. Oh, right, okay, I'm gonna skip right through. There we go. Um, so, so with this long-term um, strategic program that we've got setting out a long-term strategic roadmap, and this is um, important because I, uh, I don't think he's in the room, but Gavin Littlejohn this morning, if you were here, kind of was, um, gave a slight criticism of what we're doing in New Zealand, and, and his criticism from an open banking perspective is real, but we're not actually doing open banking. Um, although it looks and feels quite similar, it's, it's definitely come from a different place. So we, um, as part of our long-term strategy, since 2016, have been looking at what all the global drivers for change are in payments, um, and in the payments value chain, which is where data comes in. And this is just, um, just six high-level kind of themes that have just come out of our recent global scan. But these really haven't been changing much in the payments, um, in the payment space at all. And you know, payments that are always on, we all know that. Real-time payments are the new norm. You've had real-time payments here for a long time. Um, seamless, secure, invisible payments, um, drive towards the common adoption of standards, even in blockchain, you know, you do need standards to bring those, rules and standards to bring those ecosystems alive. And um, obviously, your regulators, we work in a very light touch environment, so we always get a little bit scared when we come over here or we'll go to Australia with the regulators. Um, but our regulators are quite light touch, but they are becoming slightly more... Um, interventionalist um, with the way that the world's um, kind of with how the system's evolving. Um, and so what's we believe underpinning that and what you will all know is obviously digital life, um, technology enablement, you know, APIs maybe five years ago wouldn't have even been thought of to solve many of kind of payments use cases. Um, we've got global consumers and particularly in New Zealand we do export economy. Um, and, and those regulatory catalysts are driving a lot of change. So while those um, things have just been reinforced by our recent kind of work, some research that we've done, um, they pin back to these industry strategic focus areas that we um, have been looking at for a number of years now. And these really um, represent kind of five areas of focus for Payments New Zealand and our industry in New Zealand. So fast ads, I don't know if you know many Kiwis, but we've got a lot of um, slang words like sweet, sweet ads, so this is fast ads. Um, moving to more informative and informed transactions, we want a self-governing payments industry because if we can self-govern ourselves, then we um, maybe save, so save ourselves a bit of money on the compliance side, that's for sure. Simple payment systems and international payments. So why this all makes sense to open banking Kiwi style is because out of that work uh, came um, the identification and the need for a shared API framework with API standards. And so that came from really those, um, I'll just go back, that simple payment systems. We recognise that in payments world that there's a dynamic network, that partnering, simplifying partnering was a way to enable that dynamic network. It was a way to bring in new entrants into the market, to work with incumbents and to create a more dynamic ecosystem. Um, it also came from that informative and informed transactions, how are we getting data through the payments value chain and what could customers use that for. So the basis of our open banking, and that should be a small O and a small B, um, Kiwi style was to simplify partnering, to bring innovation to market quicker, um, to kind of enable third parties and banks to come together um, on, on using standards um, to to deliver innovation to Kiwi consumers and businesses. So that's kind of the background to where we're at and why it's not regulatory driven open banking. Um, our regulator is very interested in what we're doing and has set some expectations. Um, but this has really um, been industry led and, um, and market driven. So you've all seen those, actually I think that might be we might have used your um, picture there, so I'll give credit to you, um, Ismail. Um, so the journey so far, actually, that starts in 2018, but we actually um, started some high-level investigations in 2017, working with the industry, so banks and 
um, some of our member third parties. So we probably had 20, 30 organisations in 2017 looking into the, this opportunity of developing a shared API framework and um, API standards. And that really led to an industry pilot which we kicked off last, early, last, early 2018. Um, so the industry pilot really, we got three banks, we got three third parties, we ripped off your um, open banking standards, both of them, um, that were out at the time, and I can tell you, and I've admitted this to the OBIE, um, they're about 70, 80% um, fit for purpose in New Zealand because obviously payment flows and banking systems are the same just about anywhere probably in most cases. So we took your um, account information API standard and your payments initiation um, standard and we used those, um, we had to um, play around with them a little bit to make them fit for purpose in New Zealand. But we used those in an industry pilot. And basically the pilot was so that we didn't go through an academic process, so that we could actually put something out there, we could test it. Um, it, was, it was a real test environment. Um, we left the, the, the six different parties, they set up um, bilateral terms between them. And they basically, through that pilot process, and we had some working groups as well, they were feeding back um, information that would um, support what our framework would look like, that would kind of wrap around um, the standards. They were testing about whether these standards would actually be useful in market or not. Um, and, and, and that was a really useful way to kind of um, prove the concept of um, API standards as, a, as an enabler. So, um, I mean, that was for most of last year. Into this year, we're working on the framework design. One of the things that we um, try to do as an industry is just create, um, the pilot was just on an MVP basis, and so is our framework. So we've set up a framework, um, which I'll talk about in a minute, but that, that is meant to be flexible. It's a starting point. Um, it, it, it creates some terms and conditions for how you might use our standards and how you um, partner with each other. But it's, it's, it's set as a starting point, and it's... And it's set up and designed to be flexible with a lot of um, input from market. So earlier this year, March, we um, published our version one standard, which was equivalent to the UK version two standard. Um, and then in May, late May this year, we launched our API centre. And since then, we have um, been working on all sorts of things, which I'll go into in a minute. So our API centre is based on some founding principles. One, that it's innovation first, and I know um, it seems, yeah, innovation first, but with a huge kind of customer element to that. Um, it's market driven, so we're trying to get, um, or, or we always are seeking input from the market and getting people involved in our working groups so that we can actually deliver um, or develop these APIs that will be fit for purpose and actually will get used. Um, it's industry led, so we're not, a, we sit on the industry side, we're not a regulator. Um, and I'll talk a bit about our um, governance framework. Um, it's inclusive and open, uh, which I'll talk a bit more about. Uh, but it's distributed delivery, and so that will, um, and so that means that it's not open access. Um, we leave the terms and conditions of the partnering up to the um, partners to decide what that is. Um, we have, um, although I'll go into that a bit more because we do, do set some constraints around that. So the API Centre is governed by an API Council which is made up of um, six banks, six third parties, three independents and um, a regulatory observer, so that's a headache, 15 people around the table. But it's proven so far to be really effective because you've got both your providers, your um, bank providers, and you've got your third party users um, in the room. People um, vote them in for a two year period. So that's proved to be um, really beneficial so far that it's just not a, a, a bank uh, governed thing. Uh, we've got, um, we've built our own sandbox and we're just about to launch our own um, public key store soon um, as a register for the public uh, certificates. It is, um, why we say it's inclusive and open is because there's really, what, really low barriers to entry, in fact, um, very few. 
So uh, we don't have a licensing regime in New Zealand. Um, so there's no way that um, financial services providers can accredit themselves with anyone. The regulation doesn't exist. Um, it might be something to look at in the future. So what we, um, through all of our working groups with the wider industry, what we determined is we've got what we call API providers, which are the banks. Um, all they need is a bank licence or to be regulated by our central bank. Um, and if they can prove those two things, or if they're a non-bank, they can, um, as long as they're regulated by our um, Reserve Bank or our FMA, uh, Financial Markets Authority, then they can be a provider. Um, and so that hopefully in the future, once we have um, other APIs, will let in, um, I think the pension, I think you call them here, the pension schemes and other um, uh, other types of providers. And for third parties, all you need is a New Zealand bank account, a New Zealand IRD tax number, and a genuine business interest, and you can join the API centre. And so we did that to make sure that all sorts of um, businesses uh, could, could join the standards body, which in effect we are, um, and get involved. And then we've got community contributors, people that want to use our um, sandbox. So uh, in terms of our standards journey, as I said, we've um, we ripped off your version 2 standard. Um, and we have payments and initiation account information. We've actually been working on um, version 2, which is equivalent to your version 3, um, of our standard, but with a little, um, little bit of a a little bit of a different endpoint in there. So I think your standards got decoupled flow, but this is probably the one that you might be interested in. Our version two standard has just gone out, the release candidate's gone out this week, um, and we hope to publish it in February. Um, but our version two standard is gonna have enduring payment consent in it. And that enduring payment consent is um, basically a little bit like a direct debit, really, where customers are actually in control of their consent, they'll be able to um, really potentially, um, depending on the solutions, set up their um, consent profile within their bank um, and allow third parties to such things as recurring payments, um, conditional payments, all sorts of things. So this new um, endpoint is basically what all um, our merchant community has been asking for. Um, and we're a little bit different in New Zealand as well because I, I think someone said this morning that here in the UK, the account information API is um, the main interest area for everyone. But in New Zealand, it's the payments initiation and that might be because we're payments as well. Um, but definitely this um, enduring consent endpoint is, um, is something that the merchant community, the payment gateways, um, and a lot of, like even like our tax department, local councils, they're all really interested in it. And they're interested because they see that because it's a bank to bank um, payment that, that underpins that, they see that as a much cheaper option than cards. So we'll, we'll see what happens. So that's, um, so as I said, we've got a release candidate out on that at the moment, and we're looking for feedback, and then we hope to publish um, those standards in March. Um, an interesting thing that's happened, though, is we've um, quickly kind of iterated, iterated into version two, is that we've created a little bit of lag in our system. So we launched in May, um, today we have 20 what we call standards users. Um, we've got nine banks, including the four biggest banks that kind of represent 95% of the market um, on board as, as API providers. And we've got um, now 10 third parties and about a pipeline of about 80 to 100 other companies um, that are interested in joining. Um, but as I said, we've built a little bit of lag because we've been iterating our version two standard. Some of our providers are holding out for that to be published before they um, put they, they're in production and, and they're ready for, um, they'll be ready to um, connect and um, expose their um, endpoints to third parties. So we're hoping by about the middle of next year that the majority of our providers will um, have these two version two APIs up and 
up and running and they'll be connecting with third parties. There's a couple of providers now that are using version one, um, but we're probably still another six, seven, eight months away from um, probably that critical mass and that tipping point um, in this area. Third party interest, um, here's just kind of based on, on what the feedback we're getting is what um, third parties are interested in New Zealand. So integrated payments, 30%. Um, and then, yeah, the aggregation services, which I think you call them intermediaries here. There's quite a few companies interested in, in being that platform for um, smaller co companies to plug into, um, developing alternative payment options, financial management tools, um, probably similar things to here, but maybe more skewed towards um, the payments area. As I said, the regulator um, is interested. They... Um, they, they got interested um, about 18 months after we'd started, um, so that was a good news story for them because then they were be able to tell their other um, regulator buddies that they were already onto it in New Zealand, so it's always good to um, make them feel good. Um, but yeah, so they've set out some expectations, so they expect all banks to be um, in production and to be partnering. Um, they don't expect it to be free, so um, as I said before, we do, we have set up um, a, a distributed delivery and bilateral model on the um, partnering side. We have set some minimum standards, um, so both third parties and providers, they register with the, the centre and only registered um, standards users can connect with each other and use our standard. Um, and with that, we also, um, bind them to some terms and conditions around explicit customer consent, the fact that they need dispute resolution processes in place and, you know, simple obvious, um, some liability guidelines and um, risk management things. So, so they all kind of do get bound into uh, the framework. Um, and, yeah, as I said, the minister has said he doesn't expect it to be free. Um, but he expects it to be low cost, and so we've left it open at the moment to um, the partners themselves to, to determine any commercial terms. At the moment, um, some are kind of pricing in an interesting way, others there's no price because they're getting some type of reciprocal data back. Um, so we've really left that quite open to the market. Um, I do expect, though, over time, we'll try and standardise more and more and more into that bilateral space to make it quicker and easier. And, um, yeah, in New Zealand, like here, I think this morning, it's, it's a rapid, rapidly evolving conversation. Um, people call what we do open banking, but obviously we don't have the open access part. Um, what we're doing is um, API standards. It is quickly turning into that conversation around open finance, open data, and then open life. So um, that is the New Zealand story. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jane. Do we have a question for Jane? No, I think. Do we have any question? Otherwise, I do have a, a quick one. When when you talk about, um, you know, it's not like open access and you have set sort of minimum standards, can you talk a little bit more about that? And in particular, like, what, what do you think about uh, around liability? If there is a problem, do you define minimum standards for yeah, that? Yeah, so um, we, we have set out that liability um, as where it falls. Is that right? I don't know if that's the right saying, but... Um, so if, if it's on the third party side, it's, it's their problem. If it's on the bank side, it's their problem. So um, that is probably an area that we're going to have to kind of delve a bit more into over time, um, depending on, on what happens. Because once the market's up and running, we can, um, we'll get feedback, and so some things will have to tighten up, and other things we'll be able to leave to the market, potentially. Yeah. Right, Jane, thank you so much. Uh Big round of applause. Again, if, if you're interested in open banking driven by the market, I think New Zealand is a great uh, case study for that. And thanks, Jane, for making it all the way from uh, Kiwiland.